superintendent and members of the board. Tonight, we are pleased to recognize many outstanding individuals in the Clark County School District. But first, Dr. Lanou has a special recognition for Board Appreciation Week. Great, thank you, Lisa. And certainly, uh, this goes to our school board. Uh, it's not an easy job. Um, it's one that uh, is critical for our community to make decisions about education. And I'm really pleased to, to recognize our board as part of Georgia School Board Appreciation Week which is March 14th through the 18th. So you get to come through. I don't know if you shake hands with yourselves. We'll have to figure out that, that kind of routine. But uh, I'm gonna do it by district. And so district one, Mr. Greg Davis. Oh no, get up the pot. We'll do it one at a And Mr. Payne isn't here, and that's unusual. As you know, Mr. Payne has uh, spent many, many meetings with the uh, Clark County School Board. And we got this Linda Davis, this is three. <laughs> District four, Mr. Carl Parks. Ms. Sarah Ellis. <laughs> Mr. Charles Worthy, District 6. <laughs> Ms. Carol Williams, District 7. David Hoff. And not here as well is uh, Ms. Ovita Thornton for District 9. But thank you to our board members who dedicate uh, so much time. Um, really important work. But thank you to Clark County School Board. Appreciation.
Tonight we have a few of those students with us. I will call all of their names. Christopher Barker, DeAndre Griffin, and Kendra.
I am a medically retired veteran with a third grade student at Winterville Elementary School. A short time ago, I found myself in a bind financially and was at my wit's end. While my wife was pregnant with our second child, we could hardly make ends meet while waiting on approval for disability. Our application for food stamps was declined because our income was $10 a month over the maximum amount allowed. We were down to hardly anything to eat and hardly anything else monetarily. I was desperate and reached out to Mr. Stapleton for support and advice because all else had failed. As soon as I told him about our situation, he immediately asked if he could bring us some food. This was not my intention when I wanted to meet with him, but it was what he wanted to do. Within a day, he provided my family with two boxes of food. He did not hesitate a second to help my family. Miraculously, within two weeks, I was approved and started receiving disability. Without the generosity of Mr. Stapleton, I do not know where we would be. I was so desperate, I even considered stealing food to support my family. Mr. Stapleton and myself have recently worked together to start a Veterans Day celebration for the entire Winterville community. This event is not only a way of saying thank you to veterans, but also to their families who sacrifice a lot. He is not only a great principal, but his statue is a man far exceeds others, and his door is always open for anyone. His support and actions far exceed the walls of Winterville Elementary School. Congratulations, Mr. Stapleton.
approve that. I, I just need some clarification on the policies that are out for four weeks. BBC is there, but it's also under the ones to be adopted. Can that be struck, please? Let me just go with, um, oh, hold on, but let's wait until we get there. And then whatever questions you have, and if we need to strike it all, when I call for a motion on that, I get a second on that, I call for the course, and then we can strike it all. Go ahead, Dr. Lee. Okay. With that modification on that there's going to be a change in policy, I recommend approval <coughs> of the agenda. Okay. Uh, we don't have any amendments to the agenda. We don't have any amendments. I'll uh, entertain a motion for adoption. Adopting the agenda. Got a motion from Ms. Uh, Davis, second from Mr. Davis. All in favor of adopting the agenda, raise your hand, please. Okay. And you are uh, you abstaining, Ms. Williams? Okay, all right. That's a unanimous vote. Motion flash. Okay, the next item on the agenda is um, well, uh, recommend. Let's see, we got yeah, yeah. minutes. Recommendation is Sorry. Yeah. Visitors. I am Recognition of visitors. We do have some this evening, and I'm going to read a statement before we come to the mic and speak. Uh, speakers would be limited to three minutes, and it would be flashed on these uh, screens. A yellow card would appear. Well, no, it's not. I don't know how they got on here. One minute remains, and of course, uh, you have three minutes to go. At this point, please conclude remarks. No speaker shall have no personal attacks while speaking. All comments are to be addressed uh, directly to the Board of Education uh, to protect the privacy of our students. Speakers uh, shall refrain from identifying specific students by name. Personal concerns may be uh, addressed in writing to the superintendent or the president of the Board of Education. Our first speaker for this evening is Mr. William Breeding, Academic Procedures at Cedar Shows High School. Okay, ready? To the Clark County Board of Education, and I, I would like to thank you for giving me the opportunity to speak. Uh, academic concerns are, academic concerns is one of my concerns. After re I don't want to come here and embarrass anybody, but I've exhausted every single avenue. I've talked with the principal, I've talked with the teacher involved, and there are some strange things that happen. I want you to know that first. I have a folder for each of you. I want you to read it, and as I told uh, Mr. Hardaway, follow the timeline. It is very easy to bamboozle somebody if you leave out important details and information. I want to tell you who I am. I have worked here in Clark County for 30 years. I'm a sixth generation teacher. I love my community, and I have worked very hard, <clears throat> very hard, to protect my reputation. I have a couple of dates in question. Go to city shows, board members, ask them to let you see the tape during the time period and see if what was said could have happened. Now, a great man once said, I look forward to our work together. Our dialogue remains open. Our parents are our most important partners, and our teachers are the ones who make that happen each and every day. There's a teacher who does not respect me, does not respect you, and I don't think respects this community. You work under a program that says your participation in your child's education is extremely important to us. We believe in maintaining regular two-way communication between home and school. I find it strange that you can talk to my daughter, but you can't talk to me. I come visit you by invitation on my daughter. My, well, the teacher invites my daughter. I come with her, and the first thing she says, come back without your daddy. Please read this, uh, members of the Board of Education. 
read some of the stuff I have staple in here too. I want to tell you the kind of person that I am. I wrote letters when I met children who had good manners, wrote that to the principal. I thank my counselor for doing a good job and working in a speedy manner. My few seconds are up, and I don't know whether I hand this to each person. Just leave it at the end there, <coughs> Mr. Davis, he'll pass it down. Okay, let me see how many, because I have one for well, just nine. leave nine. nine. We have uh, two hours uh, tonight, but uh, we we'll make sure they get to the older. Eight, nine, one for me as well. One also, one for the okay. superintendent. One for the superintendent. There you go. One All for right. the associate superintendent. And since your name is mentioned, there's one for you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, uh, our second speaker for the evening is Mr. Brent Andrews, Negative Climate uh, of Education. First of all, thank you for letting me speak. Um, <clears throat> my name is Brent Andrews. I've been a teacher at Cedar Shoals High School for 15 years and have children who attend Clark County Schools. Fifteen years ago, I identified myself as an advocate of students' rights. But in no way are the rights that students have today good for our students, good for our schools, or good for our communities. Students have the right to skip class and then show up after school for private instruction. Students have the right to have access to their phones without the threat of having that phone confiscated by teachers. Students have the right to sleep during class, watch videos on their phones, and ignore instruction in general, but still retake tests and quizzes as often as needed to be successful in the course. Students have the right to refuse to take a test because they did not prepare. Students have the right to show up for remediation whenever it is convenient for them and retake tests as often as needed to be successful in the course. Students have the right to curse at a teacher in the hallway and even in class without fear of real consequences. Students have the right to remain in school even when they have crossed lines each of us in this room would agree should never be crossed. I could continue listing many more rights that students have in this broken and cowardly system. But what about a student's right to learn? <coughs> what about a student's right to be challenged every moment of every day until he or she recognizes and learns to honor the strength, courage, and personal power that was bestowed upon each of us by the divine? God will not have his work made manifest by cowards. Ralph Waldo Emerson said that in his essay on self-reliance. He also said, trust thyself. Every heart vibrates to that iron string. Great men have also always done so and confided themselves childlike, childlike to the genius of their age, betraying their perception that the eternal was stirring at their heart, working through their hands, predominating in all their being. The genius of Martin Luther King's age was that an oppressed people rose up against the entire justice system of the United States and declared it a lie, and through their own blood and sacrifice, transformed that hideous lie into truth. I hope that one day people will look back and say that the genius of American society in 2016 was that local communities, us, rose up against nonsensical, corrupt, and ineffective education policies. Policies that take away control from local school districts, policies that bind the hands of teachers, administrators, school boards, and our superintendent. Policies that harm students by allowing them to succumb to their baseless impulses because they have no fear of consequences. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Andrews. Katie Baker, Katie Baker, Negative Climate of Education. Hi, everybody. <clears throat> Thank you guys so much for being here on this rainy Thursday. I'm sure you wouldn't be here unless you loved our children. So I really appreciate the opportunity to be here. Can you hear me now? There you go. Okay. 
So my name is Katherine Baker Johnson. I'm an English teacher at Cedar Shoals High School and a happy English teacher at Cedar Shoals High School. Unlike some of the news media that you have seen lately, I love my job and I do love my students. Um, every person in this room has made mistakes. Many of you have probably said to a child that we learn from our mistakes. But what are our children learning from their mistakes in our current school climate? Teachers like us three get to see that every single day. Are they learning that their actions have consequences and that they must think very carefully before they do or say anything? Or are they learning that the system is often broken and that they can do whatever they want to do sometimes, say whatever they want to say sometimes, and then stand by and watch as adults make excuses for their poor choices and do whatever it takes to push them through the broken system in an effort to reach state mandated rates of graduation? I personally was a member of Hill Chapel Baptist Church throughout college. Um, Mr. Vernon Payne was actually the person who took me in and encouraged me to teach at Clark, in Clark County. And I can attest to the fact that African American leaders and communities in this town are always pushing their students, their children, to be the best that they can be and that there are consequences for their actions. However, at Cedar Shoals, oftentimes what we see from the leaders there is that our students do not have consequences for their actions. Accountability is the defining educational buzzword of our time. Teachers are held accountable for sure for students' performance on standardized tests. And administrators are held accountable for student performance on standardized tests. And I'm sure you can all agree that school district personnel are held accountable by scores, ratings, and consequences from the state, which affect district funding and the district's ability to self-govern. Accountability is a good thing. But as adults, accountability continues to grow. Student accountability shrinks. For instance, if I don't bring my laptop to work, I can't do my job. I can't check my emails. I can't take attendance. But if students at Cedar Shoals don't bring their laptops to school, often what happens is teachers are required to give them paper assignments, and there's no consequences for them not bringing these amazing laptops that y'all have given to us. And so what the teachers are asking for is more accountability measures and personnel that we can continue to show our students what real life looks like inside the classroom so that we can train them up for life. I appreciate all y'all have done for our school and the resource you have given to us. And all we are asking is for more personnel to show our students what accountability looks like. Thank you so much. Thank you. Okay, our last speaker for this evening, and I trust that I get this name correct. <laughs> Barucha. Barucha. Okay. You on. Hello. Good evening. Good evening. Uh, my name is Amit Barucha. I am also a teacher at Cedar Shoals. Um, I've been teaching there seven years in the math department. So, uh, a few years ago, the Georgia Charter School Amendment went passed by large margins because they claim that, quote, providing for improving student achievement and parental involvement through more public charter school options. This is a classic half-truth. It is true that each of us wants to improve student achievement in our community. It is true that each of us would like to increase parental involvement in our community. However, the claim that Charter School Amendment 1 has brought us closer to achieving either of these goals is absolutely false. In November 2016, Georgia voters will be asked at the polls to answer SR 287 Opportunity School District question. Shall the Constitution of Georgia be amended to allow the state to intervene in chronically failing schools in order to improve student performance? Who would not want to intervene in chronically failing schools? Who would, want, who would vote no in improving school, student improvement? Yet, this is another example of our state legislator and our governor using rhetoric to confuse and beguile voters. The fact is, the state has already the power to intervene through progression of measures over time, the fear within education which drives us to conform and to do our best to stay off focus school lists is, the state, it is that the state can and will take over schools which do not meet the state expected timeline of progress. The Opportunity School District Amendment will remove due process and the opportunities of school districts to make change over time, which could result in higher student achievement and the removal of schools from their list of due. SR 287, otherwise known as the Opportunity School District Amendment, will further prevent local school districts from crafting their own policies to best address the needs of our own students.
pretty much developed a plan to get everyone in this community, regardless of race, political affiliation, or income level, to come together to oppose the Opportunity School District Amendment. We cannot consent to losing all control of how our children are educated, but we must also not consent to following policies we know as educators to be harmful to the authentic learning. I hope Dr. Lanou, since he has decided to stay in Clark County, will help us lead this charge, as he has already expressed disagreement with various state policies that have been against the interests of our own school district. I hope Dr. Lanou and the school board will also think to reinstate our district attendance policy at the high school level, which sends a message that classroom instruction is important, so important, in fact, that if you miss too many days without documented excuses, you cannot earn credit. If one feels he or she deserves the credit due to special circumstances, he can present the case before the review panel. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. I want to thank all of you for your time this afternoon, uh, this evening. Uh, points we are taken. Uh, Dr. Lanou, we're going to move the agenda. We're down to item D. Let me try to frame this and I'll take job off here. At least for the crowd. Um, Obviously, we've had lots of conversations about our charter system uh, petition, which then gets translated into a contract uh, with the state. First and foremost, I want to thank everyone because this has been some really good work. Um, and it's been trying work because you have to negotiate. Um, I'm really pleased that at Clark County, we push that envelope uh, really hard. And, and I think we're at a, a, a juncture now where we need to move forward with the work that we've done in the charter system application. The process at this point is, uh, well, let me just take you back. Uh, my last point of information was that the charter contract was going to go to the state board for approval in February. I thought that way it was in January, February. We pulled it off because there was some language in that contract that wasn't in our petition. But in some ways, that standard contract that goes into all, but we wanted to tease out those questions. We have done that with the work of uh, Tim Jarbo and James Farlman, uh, as well with uh, Lures Dees uh, from the Department of Education. We've determined now through this whole process that there are, uh, that that what we've asked for in our petition is mostly there. There are several pieces that are not. Tim, you're gonna go through that in the presentation. But what I wanna ask tonight is that if the board feels in agreement with the recommendation that we would vote the charter system at now the contract, it's no longer a petition, this is the actual contract, which would go to the state board for their review. There's one small step in there. We have to go to a flexibility committee meeting just prior to the board. But if the board approves uh, my recommendation tonight to send the contract to the state board, then we would move forward in that process. So with that, Tim has uh, we've got to put together a short presentation to explain where we're at. Very short, seven slides. So, um, so what we've done on this first slide is try to frame what we had in our petition and what ended up in the contract that the the Charter Commission Division uh, is going to send to the State Board of Education. So if you look, we kind of wrapped it around four basic pieces that, that seem to be different from what we had in the Charter Petition. And after I go through this table, then we've got four slides, one slide for each category, where we'll discuss how the State Charter Commission Division has kind of um, tried to resolve the, the difference between the contract and the petition. So the first thing in the petition is the Career Academy. In our petition, we said we wanted to maintain its current governance structure um, and level of autonomy, but still remain part of our charter school system technically as a, as a career academy. Um, the charter contract basically says that in order for the career academy to uh, be called the college and career academy, we've got to meet their definition of the career academy, which means it has its own governance, its own control of its budget, its own control of hiring, it's really a separate nonprofit entity. Uh, so we'll talk about that in just a second. So that's one point that where our petition and what's in the contract is different. The next piece was the use of literacy assessments as a way, as a SLO growth measure. 
uh, in order to implement a district-wide focus on literacy. We had put forth in the petition that we would use literacy as a growth measure for all student learning objective assessments as part of the evaluation system for all courses that are not measured with the Georgia milestones. And the state has, uh, we've had lengthy, lengthy discussions with them and they finally have just basically told us that that's not allowed under their current interpretation of um, working with the uh, teacher and leader division in the state of Department of Education, so we can't do that. And they said we can only use literacy assessments when tied to core standards uh, or course outcomes. So in other words, we could use our literacy assessments for English language arts courses or reading courses, but not other courses. So they pretty much spelled that out for us in the charter contract. Third area was in terms of operational goals. We wanted to have operational goals focused on some additional areas besides the, they have a few, you know, for beating the odds and some of those pieces, but the other operational goals, we wanted it to be centered around our governance team, formation, training, and accountability, around how we're implementing personalized digital learning environments, and college and career readiness. The contract is, has go, operational goals that focus around uh, the governance team, formation, training, and accountability. However, instead of those other two areas, they said that you have to have goals around positive and safe school environments and the economic sustainability of being a charter district. Uh, and I'll talk about that in just a second. Then the last uh, difference deterrent had to do with our governance team matrix timeline for implementing our governance teams. Remember, governance teams have a minimum amount of authority that we have to give them, and then we can give them additional authority as outlined in our charter contract. And originally, we had said we wanted to start in fall, next fall, implementing the minimum authority, and then grant teams the additional authority the, in the next school year, fall of 2017. That was to kind of not give teams too much at one time to do. Uh, the contract we did receive had a much accelerated. They had said, as they earlier stated, they wanted us to begin this spring, even before the contract's approved, and then implement the additional authority next year. So that kind of frames the four areas, and I'll go through each one of these areas pretty quickly here. So the first one was, in terms of the contract resolution, they pretty much pretty clearly, I'm trying to move my little slide thing here too. Um, at the end of the fiscal year, uh, according to our current contract, what they here's how they've resolved this. At the end of the current fiscal year, our career academy loses its contract at, with the state as a charter school. So it will no longer become a charter school, which we expected. Uh, beginning July 1st, it will become a college and career program within our school district. We can still do everything we're doing right now. We can have a governance team. The, our governance team for the career academy can continue to function like it does. Board members retain control over really the hiring and the, the budget, all of those things. It does not have to become a nonprofit entity. So uh, uh, the governance structure is going to stay the same. So really, the thing that's going to change is it's not going to technically, in the state's eyes, be a charter school. It's going to be a charter program within our district, but we can continue to run it exactly like we've had, offer the same kinds of programming, the same kind of opportunities for our kids. So really, it doesn't change anything except the name. Let me just stop. Uh, let me just make a comment about schools and programs because we use those a little bit interchangeably around the charter career academies. Career academies are not a separate school. They do not have a separate number. So even our charter was a program. There's an interesting movement as they look at them as charter career academies as school as themselves with their own funding mechanism. It moves closer to a school, but it doesn't have its own school number. So I just want to know, we've always had it as a program, um, and, and uh, from the schools, our students don't transfer to the Career Academy. They stay at Clark Central, Cedar, Classic City. What we're saying here is that it will stay the same. It will do just that, and if we have to define the governance structure, we'll do it through policy. However, I've had lots of conversation with the Lieutenant Governor's Office their uh, legislation right now that we can maintain our current structure and still be a college and career academy uh, as it was originally when we founded it. So we have to go through that change. So, uh, so fine, we'll, we'll, we won't put it under the charter system, but that doesn't mean at all that we don't have a, a career academy. It's going to have its governance board. It's going to be just what it's doing now. It's just a matter of how we define it and where we are. Right. 
And that's what the bold face print says, that you know, we could, if, legis if some legislation that's being proposed goes through, go back and have it be a career, a college and career academy in a traditional definition. So we don't think that change is, will have any impact on what we're doing currently or how we would implement the charter system. Go to the next piece, the literacy ass assessment. Um, basically, uh, we will continue to have SLOs only when specific as a literacy assessment, using a literacy assessment as an SLO, only again, like I said, when it's tied to core standards and course outcomes about language arts or reading. Uh, it cannot be the SLO for all courses. They're pretty clear on that. Um, it'll continue, we will as a district and as a charter district, we can continue to focus on literacy across the uh, spectrum K-12. We can still continue to do that uh, because we know literacy is key to college and career readiness and success. We just cannot replace our SLOs with that. So that's the biggest change in the contract. Uh, we can't move forward in terms of replacing SLOs with the literacy assessments. Now, that may change depending on some current legislation that's before the Senate and the House. Um, if that legislation goes through, uh, the Charter Division has said that it, all school districts will be able to revisit the flexibility contracts because the legislation that's proposed right now says if you have it in your flexibility contract, you can do some different things with SLOs. It's a little, we haven't, you know, there's no guidance yet on how that would work because the law hasn't passed. But, uh, so we feel like we've been told we will be given the opportunity if that law passed to come back to the contract and revisit it. So we feel that that's an appropriate piece. Right? Yeah, let me just say something about uh, Senate Bill 364. So those out there, if there are any questions around that, I would strongly contact our legislators. Um, it's uh, really got sponsored from Lindsay Tippins out of the Senate. Um, Tim and I have been working closely with Senator Tippins. Um, in fact, I will say we uh, wrote a revision uh, to the to the House Bill 30, 32, 244, and it's originally a month and a half ago. Uh, it essentially says it is unfair to evaluate uh, our teachers on single growth measures. Um, you know, we had reduced that amount and we looked at a mechanism where we would do it in-house and not simply do it on standardized tests. Now, we didn't get that full piece, but we have moved that um, there's language now in a flexibility contract that talks about multiple measures, talks about reducing that uh, at least amount for teachers. Uh, and, and so maybe not exactly what we would want, but it's a, it's a huge shift. I think it probably still has a ways to go before it goes all the way to the governor's office, but that's my opinion. Uh, but nonetheless, it got sponsored by the, uh, by the head of the Senate, which is Lindsay Tempins. Um, and it's backed by the uh, Department of Education, and it will take us certainly uh, a lot farther in terms of doing what we think is right and helpful compared to what we have now. <coughs> that's why I think it's important to put our flexibility, that's why it's important to have our charter system, because whatever comes down, I've got a feeling it's getting, starting to get linked to flexibility contracts, and those are either through a charter system, or they're either gonna be through the strategic waiver system. So I think it's gonna position us Really well as we move there, we're going to have to change our own every time. Did that pass the Senate? Yes, it, 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 it passed the Senate. It's in the House. Right? What's the outlook in the House? Do you know I, I don't know. I think there's a testifying next week. I'm, I've got to call into the DOE to see if I need to go. I have a number of questions about this application. I don't want to belabor it here, so if I could arrange some time to spend with you, Tim, or somebody sure. to explain yeah. some language. And I'm looking at some inconsistency uh, in terms of how we refer to local school governance. And uh, just a few tweaks. I just need a little bit more time. I'd be glad to sit down and go through this. I can come to work tomorrow. That'd be great. Uh, Mr. Howell. So the uh, so basically, we have to to capitulate <coughs> on the slows in terms of we still use the literacy assessments for uh, reading, and literature, and courses, which is really what we're doing right now. Okay, and we're still going to do that in all our other courses anyway, but we're going to have to. We do this, we're going to have to, to right. go along with these other slows. We currently give some literacy assessments across the board K twelve as universal screeners. 
we were going to be, and right now we're using those assessments as the SLO assessments in language arts courses where we have to have SLOs. And there's some in high school, some in middle, some in high school, some in elementary school. We were hoping to replace all the SLO tests, and the teachers have said, don't give them useful information, with literacy assessments um, in all courses, and the state's pretty much clearly said, no, we're not going to allow you to do that. And we've, we've gone through two different divisions in the Georgia Department of Education, and they finally come together and had that discussion and said, you can't do it. So with the petition the way it is now, if you're a, um, if you're a, a advanced algebra teacher in high school, you're still gonna have an advanced out, a traditional advanced algebra SLO assessment to measure student achievement for your yeah. teacher learning. Yeah, you know, it's quite interesting. When you look at Senate Bill 364, it doesn't mention SLOs. Correct. It does not mention SLOs. It uses broader language like multiple measures. So just so we know is, I know I'm talking to Senator Tibbs, I can't speak for him. You know, but the, what I was hearing is, is to move away from slopes. So there's no SLO designation in SB 240, in SB 364. It just says multiple measures to be decided by, by the district, district, which a lot of people are interpreting as, that means districts can choose to so be flexibility, you know, within that context. So, you so for, our, for us as a district, we would be able to continue to focus on literacy uh, as a district, as governance teams, they can implement innovations in that area. We just can't use those measures as the student growth measure for teacher evaluation. But, but you're using slows in the, in the language arts uh, courses. Right now we can because a literacy <coughs> measure like the Lexile score is directly tied to the core standards. You know, are you, in fact, there's, there are standards in ELA classes about literacy. So, Any idea of approximately how many? Because when you first presented this, uh, it was tons of them. We had 63 the first year they gave us, they gave all school districts flexibility. So this past year, I believe we had 45 SLO That's bad. assessments. That's bad. And, and let me say this, when you look at legislation like SB 364, once that's passed, it then has to go into the DOE for the procedures of how to do SB 364. So there's some very broad language to, right, that we have in there that you just don't know how it's going to get interpreted when it goes to the DOE. So that's why we're pretty hesitant to say it's going to be X. I'm not sure what it's going to be because the language and law leaves room for procedures. It's kind of like the contract. The contract looks really different from what we thought it would look like. Sometimes you think there's not a lot of the petition in the contract, but it's a standard contract is what they told us. This is So you come to the next part, operational goals are a good example of that. Originally, uh, in, in contracts that used to be given, they had these goals about student achievement. We talked about the beating the odds measure, the CCRPI measure. Then they had what they called operational goals, which were usually based on additional priorities from your charter petition. Like for us, technology, implementing governance teams, and um, uh, what was the other one? Uh, hence, drawing like that. Um, so we had some of those pieces. Now what they're saying, because they did revisit the charter school law, um, earlier this year, I believe, they refined some pieces in it. Now, every charter system contract that's approved has to have some operational goals centered around these areas. Promoting uh, fostering school governance, promoting positive school experiences, uh, some of those pieces. Um, they were, I'll tell you right now, they were, um, yeah, but I'm gonna go back to this. Governance team formation and training, positive and safe school environments, and economic sustainability. So what the state has now said is the charter contract has to have three goals about that. And they define those for us in the contract. They, they talk about the report, the financial audits that the state does. That's a measure that they will use to say do charter systems, can they be economically sustained? sustained. Then they will talk about, um, the other piece was they put in that, um, they talk about the governance teams and that you have to have an implementation process for governance teams. Then they put into the contract that they will measure, measure positive and safe school environments using the Georgia Parent Survey that's administered annually by all school districts in the state of Georgia for the CCRPI index. And also, Tim, they have the climate rating, so there's a whole other thing. Right, there's a piece in there about, about the climate, so remember that's something new that scores you on how 
and the Georgia School, yeah, the Georgia School category indicators. Georgia School person, the Georgia Parent Survey feeds the results of that feeds the school climate rating. Um, which you know, there is useful, you know, the, we do get results from the Georgia Parent Survey, or the, via the Climate Star rating. So, um, so that's a standard piece now. They say every contract going forward has will have those, those, um, those objectives in it. Those. Uh, operational goals, and there's no de there's no debating that. That's their decision. So again, we don't think those goals will necessarily prevent us from moving forward on any of our charter district innovations. And then the last piece is the timeline. Um, so when you look at that, we don't feel like that's a big change for uh, a negative for us, and it's going to prevent us from moving forward on our charter district innovations. The last area is the governance matrix, governance key matrix timeline. Um, they had originally in the contract said that we had to have a faster timeline. We had to start implementing this spring. We went back with some conversations just the past few days and they revised the contract. So that's what this last one says to me. So the contract now says exactly what we got in our petition. That we would implement next fall, the, the, the minimum authorities, and then we got additional authority in the fall after that. So fall 2016, next fall, we start implementing governance schemes with some minimum authorities and then we finish some additional authorities in fall 2017, the following year. And I have to say, Tim, and that was one of the hard lines we put on this. We said, listen, we're not going to start for that. And they, as you recall, they wanted to start before it was even approved. And so we held out and said, listen, we're, we're not going to, we're going to get our government teams up and running. We're going to have the right training. They need to be prepared before we actually start in 2017. Yeah, I'm, uh, you talk about the flexibility contract. So we've got one contract here, and then that is our flexibility, that's flexibility contract. contract. That's the flexibility that's they refer to as flexibility. This is the this is the flexibility contract. It gives us flexibility as a charter district from certain state regulations. Actually, the the charter is compared to the strategic waiver. The strategic waiver has really identify what your uh, what you want it to be waived. The charter uh, gives you the broadest range of waivers. So it, it's waivable, even though we don't mention it, we can, we can ask for that to be waived. I mean, here's our charter application, and we were asking for specific waivers. And so now, the way they've written this is that. Well, the, the, the charter applicant, the petition right. asks for specific, it, it tries to say how we would use specific waivers. But part of it also says we get, if we are approved, we get broad flexibility for all waivers. Whereas if you're a strategic waiver district, you're, you actually say the, the exact number of waivers you want, and those are the only waivers you will get as a strategic waiver district. A little bit of difference there. So we wrote it one way and we're accepting it in another way. Is that? Yes, no. Like no. Not, no, it's not that. We wrote it. We wrote it saying we want to have broad flexibility for all waivers. Specify. But we had to specify. They wanted examples. Right. So those are all, you can kind of think of those as examples of waivers that we are pretty sure we would be using. It was kind of a strange thing. They said you get flexibility in all waivers, but we want you to name them. Or you can't name every single waiver in there. It really is this, Greg. It, it really just says that as a charter system, we get all waivers to include such things as these, and we list them. Just so they would have a sense that we were trying to connect our waivers specifically to certain actions and donations. So the only thing the contract says is that things were not allowed to waive. And those are the same things there that were in the guidance for creating our petition. So there's really nothing in the contract that says we cannot waive this. There are no restrictions in the contract beyond what we've known from the beginning that they were concerned about, that SLOs, that's the biggest piece that is in the contract that still says you can't waive that. The other things they say in the contract, like I think there's something there about you can't waive Title I regulations and federal regulations. We know that it was in the guidance originally. Uh, so I can, you, can you address the, the, the whole apprenticeship issue? I know you did a little bit today. Yeah, this was the whole thing about moving with the apprenticeship. Uh, I think there was some confusion because they were talking about dual enrollment. Uh, that, that there were some questions that we couldn't, couldn't waive the dual enrollment. And we didn't really quite understand exactly. I don't think they understood what we were, we were wanting. What we were wanting to do is apprenticeships. 
So what's happening right now is there's, there's some flexibility, Mark, within the, uh, the curriculum guide where we can start aligning uh, some of our work-based learning to actually courses. And in fact, in talking with, with Athens Tech, they're into a new e-portfolio system that really can allow us, instead of the old way we would, we would what, we would, uh, articulation, articulation agreements, we don't have to do those, and our kids can do it through portfolio. So we believe we've got some really creative ways to work through that. Okay, but it, okay, but it, it, there's no specific waiver in there that says what you can do, but what we're asking isn't really defined. So we feel we can, we can, we can get to where we need. But we don't need to necessarily go through Athens Tech to do that, right? Correct, correct. Okay. Right. But that was just one way that's a, a unique way that's very, very different than our situation. So really the biggest difference between our petition and the waiver, I mean the, the petition and the contract that you see there, it's really different in two ways. One is we cannot use literacy assessments as the SLO for all courses. That's one difference. Then the other difference is that we are going to have as part of the contract some organizational goals centered around the positive and safe school environment, the, those three areas, positive and safe school environment, being economically sustainable as a school district, which we are actually probably one of the most sound fiscal school districts in the state right now and then how to implement governance So, um. I just want to come back to Board Member Davis, because it's a really good point. I mean, I think, I think the other piece that we've been working hard is around GPP, Great Promise Partnership, uh, with our jobs. And so we're looking at different ways in which kids can be trained. Um, and there's some real linkages there to their career pathways with our manufacturing company. So I see Great Promise as Great Promise Partnership. That's what I'm um, I think uh, we had a meeting last night and we had training for the government teams. Do we have that as a slide? I can remember. We do not have that as a slide. Well, yeah, it actually, the last slide. Let, let me, Mr. Worthy, I'll do this slide and see if that answers your question. Okay. Okay, so if we, if we move forward, what we would say is that we want to present uh, and recommend for board approval, present to progress and recommend for board approval the state charter system contract. Let the state board consider it. Let them approve it. If they approve it, then it has to come back to us for, you, for uh, Mr. Gordon to sign as board president, I believe is the procedure they've outlined. So we like to move it forward so they can hear, hear it. Uh, we have to go for a meeting and explain it one more time to the Charter Commission subcommittee in the set with state board members present, and then the state board members will approve it. We do that. That will happen on the 30th. On the 31st, the state board will approve it. And then after that, there'll be some things we need to discuss, like how do we want to train the governance teams? Um, Dr. Lanou's thought right now is we ought to do a request for a proposal to find, uh, see if there are community groups who want to help with training the governance teams. Part of the contract for all charter districts is to do a needs assessment. We think we have a lot of expertise in our uh, community in terms of what is a needs assessment for the community. Uh, we ought to probably do a request for proposal to make that as broad as we can so that we can give governance teams real information about the different communities in our school district and the needs that they're in. Let me sort of go a little bit deeper into that. Um, obviously, there's some funding, at least at the current, that would come with um, a charter system. Uh, I believe that funding would come to us probably uh, in February, which is still part of our fiscal year. Larry, you've seen some preliminaries. We don't know, but we estimate it's probably somewhere around a million dollars. Um, that, as you know, as part of the uh, contract, we cannot use as part of our operations. You cannot go to the general fund. Um, in this first year, uh, our discussion so far has been that we really need to uh, ensure the integrity of our processes for our local governance team. That is, in selection, in training, and in implementation, which would go for 2017. Um, we have a lot of resource here in our community or in our state about training with government entities. Um, we are beginning to look to bring to the board and thinking about an RFP that would actually have, uh, we would contract with an agency to actually do that work. And that work would be 
putting together the guidelines for the government's team to operationalize them, to actually do the training, to work on, on the uh, selection, um, and to do some of that oversight. We all have an oversight committee, but they would do the bulk of the work. I don't think right now we have the capacity to do that, but there are people that do this for a living. I think that would be a good use of our initial money from the charter uh, to actually do just that, to ensure the integrity of the processes. Right? So that would be, that would be if it's approved, we would come back and, and, and have the board look at an RFP to explain what we're trying to do with that. Um, the second one, and it's always been part of our conversation, has been the needs assessment. Since our charter is based on building capacity in our neighborhoods, it would be important to understand what does capacity mean in our neighborhoods? What are those elements? What does it look like? There's some people that are doing some really good work with geomapping around finding where those resources are. Um, I think part of this process, in order to give good information to our local governance teams, is to begin to define what is it, what are the resources that we need to provide the support to our communities, what are the resources we have now, what are the steps. Uh, so there's really two pieces that we're looking at if we move forward um, and, and, and get approved. If we approve it, we'll move forward and the state board approves it. The, after this March state board meeting, no more con charter contracts will be heard by the state board until May. So we felt like they worked with us. We feel good about the contract where it is. It's in essence going to let us do all the things we wanted to do, except for the SLO piece. So we feel like it's time to go ahead and let the state board hear it so that we get, the get it back in time that we can start working with the community and principals going into the late spring in terms of choosing members of the governance teams and planning for that. Uh, the recommendation you have, I just want to make one point because I know we've had some board members here from the community and we've heard from the community. You know, there's this whole concern about the fair dismissal piece. So if you notice, we put into the board recommendation statement that as a district, as a charter district, we still will follow fair dismissal procedures that are, you know, the federal fair dismissal guidelines. And we, you know, we're not planning to change our policies that 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 require us to implement fair dismissal. And that we've heard that from teachers and board members, and so that's important. We asked if we could put it into the charter contract itself, and the charter division said that they do not allow systems to put it into the charter contract themselves because of the. Judicial judicial actions that have come down that said charter systems don't have to follow that. So, um, but we did want to clarify that we're going to do it, whether or not the contract gives us the ability. Their recommendation was at that point to put it into uh, our local piece when we move it forward. So, um, if you notice, that's what the just for the record, that's why we have a hard copy version. As I emailed you earlier, the hard copy version is what we'll work from, which mentions the Fair Dismissal Act. That if the board moves forward this contract. It's only with the understanding that the fair dismissal act will be in place for the cartridge commission. Which it is right now. And we have local right policy, policy, policy that requires us to follow that. But the rationale doesn't sound logical to me. I mean, say it again to me. I just want to make sure. Which I'm rationale? From the state perspective. Why, why, why it can't be a, a part of Making it. teachers, making 50% of test scores part of teacher evaluation doesn't sound logical either. either but then, so there's been a <laughs> judicial action, a judicial ruling in the state court decision, a court decision right. in Georgia has said that charter systems do not have to follow fair dismissal right. guidelines. So right. the charter right. division says they cannot put that into the contract since some, some judges have said charter systems right. don't have to. Right. So what we're saying is we will, we will, right. and we're not planning to change. It would take uh, you all as board members to change our local policy governing fair dismissal. Right. I think it'd be pretty difficult for board action. That's why we wanted to make sure when this got moved forward, it's very clear with the understanding we're committed that the fair dismissal act um, will be used by the Clark County School Right. That's why we put it in. And if I can say, I, I think I understand the question. And this case actually, since it's been interpreted, actually went beyond saying you'll have to follow it. It went a step further and said that even if you choose to follow it at the local level, the Georgia Department of Education does not have jurisdiction to hear an appeal from here. So if they're trying to sort of remove them, or at least under this court case, they're removed altogether from it. We can follow the procedures 
up until the point it would go to the Georgia Department of Education, but this court case says they're not going to hear an appeal for what you do, regardless of what you say. And I think that's kind of, that would seem to be the logic. Well, that which means that, that the fair dismissal act would be at the district level, yeah. and that would be the final decision at the district level. Mm -hmm. yeah. And this is only the charter system. Correct. That's what it's ever going to be. I need some clarification on this million dollars that I heard. I think from the initial point, I read somewhere in print that during a charter system that you would get seventy to ninety dollars more per student. Is that calculated on that million dollars? That's what we got. Okay. It is it is proved. Remember funding changes every year. You know what I mean? And they still continue to fund them. Um, we'll get funded this year, but there's never a guarantee that <coughs> it comes out of the budget. So my um, question on this contract, how binding is this language in this We have 
upheld our integrity through this whole piece. Uh, it's been very clear. I think our legislators know where we're coming from. Uh, I don't think we're going to do anything that's different than what we said we were going to do. Uh, and I think as a board and a community, if it's not what we want to do, we're not going to do it. We're not going to do it. I don't, I don't think this binds us as a group to say we have to do it because it's in our contract. We can pull our contract or revise it. Um, but some of this language is just stock language. Um, but it doesn't, it's not going to drive our, uh, it's not going to drive any of the outcomes that we just had. There lies my confusion. Okay. I'm good. I have several more, but again, I'll take them up with you. I have a question. How about the governance team uh, career academy? Who is actually on the governance team? Well, we, we have a full, we have Cynthia Anderson, member of the governance team here. Um, Dexter Fisher is the, is the chair. Um, their advisory, Lawrence Harris, isn't here, but uh, he is the CEO of the Career Academy. Uh, he sets the agenda with uh, the, the president. It is purely advisory. We've kept it advisory. Uh, so they help guide the decisions, the local decisions. A lot of it is information, making connections with our businesses. We have a lot of business partners that uh, feel very connected uh, to the schools through this career academy. But they remain advisory. And we've been, we've been very clear from the get-go that that this school board has been supportive of career academies, the programs that you approve. Um, no, no career academy program is approved unless it goes to this board through the program of studies. So I think it really as much as about communication, connection with our, with our business community. And we have, uh, gosh, 16 members, Athens Tech, uh, ourselves, our principals, uh, and then a number of, of uh, business and manufacturing members. And parents. In many ways, it looks like a local governance team, a little broader than you would see probably as. One day we need to uh, have that pointed out for I me. Mean, I may be next to somebody that's on the team at the time. I appreciate the work that I need to know who they are. We can certainly do that. In fact, we can include some of our minutes. I can give that to the board. That might be a good one. I'm a little concerned about the time frame. I think probably you are too. Um, I'm just trying to figure out if, if we're supposed to do this, March 31st is when we're going to begin to, it's going to be approved and then we're going to be trying to do what next? I mean, I'm just trying to figure out how we do everything before the end of school. It isn't. It's not. What happens is, if you look at one of the things in the timeline is that our implementation isn't until the fall of 2017. We did that on purpose so that we would have time to prepare. If it's approved, looking at our RFPs, we can prepare, as you said here, a more defined timeline, you know what I mean, of targets in which we want to uh, get on board, we want to have the manuals, we want to start our core uh, selection process for governance team and our training. But we would have, we, we would have a year. I, I mean, I, I'm just saying, I, I think we need to have our governance teams ready to go by by late spring so we can begin the approval process. I just missed the, the year. Okay. In terms of the school governing council's termination request, it says any, any school governing council can request termination. several different languages here because we're asking to be a charter system. They're also looking at systems of charters, which are independent entities. So as you know, right back when we first did the governance team, the Charter Commission had some real struggles of defining uh, startup charters and charter system language. And, um, yeah, you could theoretically submit a charter petition 
that says just we're going to become a charter system, but every school is like their own little self-controlled unit, that, like their own self-controlled unit. They can decide on their own curriculum, on their own, you know, budget. All, you know that they have total autonomy, and that'd be a system of charters. We did not choose. To do we did not choose to do that. So the answer would be is if they don't want to do that, sorry. You can't do Other questions? Thank you, Mr. Java. Okay, Doctor, then we'll be down to item E, board reports. Uh, let's see who has reports. Uh, GSBA. Payne's not here. Is there a GSBA report?
Thank you, Finance Committee. No. Good, thank you. Policy, and we just want to make a note just on that policy BBC we struck that. Anything for policy? No report. Okay. Property? Second for Miss Davis. Okay. Any questions pertaining to these minutes? Any questions? All in favor? Motion passed. Uh, recommend approval of the financial report January 2016. Okay. The financial report for January of 2016. Need a motion on that? So moved. Moved by Mr. Davis. Got a second on that. Second from Miss uh, Ellis. Questions about the financial report? Question? All in favor? Okay. Motion passed. All right, policies and there are regulations. I'm asking those to be adopted by the board, uh, with the exception that policy BBC has been scratched. Uh, so I recommend approval of both the policies and regulations. Okay, item three, policies for adoption here. Yeah, recommendation from the superintendent. I need the motion on that. Moved by Ms. Uh, Davis. Got a second on that. Second by Mr. Davis. Any questions pertaining to these policies or regulations? We only voted on the policies now. Okay, all okay. The, just a little correction. We uh, we did the policy. We now vote on regulations. Yeah. When did that change? <laughs> oh, sorry. <laughs> so we are voting. No, we are voting. voting. Yes. Yeah. Sorry. I sure read delivery. Yes, we vote on the vote. So we have what two regulations? That's there. correct. Okay. All right. Now, need a motion on that. Move by Mr. Huff. 
Uh, Sandra now there? Sandra Davis. Davis. Okay, Miss Davis. And Amy, who? Mr. Davis. And okay. Davis. Davis. Okay. All right. Any questions pertaining to the uh, policies and record uh, and also the regulations? Okay. All in favor? All right. Thank you. Ms. Davis, did you uh, uh, now recommend? Oh, is that? Ms. Davis, did you vote on that? Yeah. Okay. Oh, I didn't see your hand. Okay. Both of you Okay, go ahead. Okay. okay. Recommend, uh, okay. Sorry. <laughs> recommend approval of the consent agenda. Okay, consent agenda, 4 through uh, 18. I need a motion on that. Moved by Ms. Davis again. Second by Ms. Davis. All in favor of the consent agenda. Okay, one abstention. Okay, all right. Okay, now, item uh, 19, or uh, Dr. Lene. 19, we've had a discussion. I'm recommending that we approve the charter system contract to be considered by the State Board of Education. Okay, recommendation from the superintendent to approve the charter system contract to be considered by the State Board of Education. I need a motion on that. Move by Mr. Huff. Got a second on that. Second by Mr. Parks. I guess we've had all the questions. Do we have additional questions? If not, we need a vote. So we go ahead and vote. Okay. All righty. Thank you. Motion passed. And we have. Abstaining on that? I'm uh, abstaining on okay. that also. Your abstention, Ms. Thorne and Ms. Uh, Davis, okay. Okay, Dr. Lanier. Recommend? Recommend approval of personal recommendations and the uh, TRS audit and closing the personal. Okay, that's the recommendation. And the addendum, sorry, and the addendum. Recommendation from the superintendent on personnel from your iPads that you've read, and also we have an addendum here. Uh, I need a motion on that. Need a motion for the uh, personnel recommendation. Moved by Ms. Davis. Got a second on that. Second by Ms. Ellis. Okay. All in favor? This recommendation. Uh, okay. All right. Did I get your hand, Mr. Park? Okay. All right. Motion passed. I recommend we go into executive sessions for the reasons of personnel and evaluation of the superintendent. Okay, uh, recommendation is going to executive session by the superintendent. What now? First of all, evaluation of the superintendent. Okay, now, we move to that. Move by Mr. Hunt, second by Mr. Ellis. All in favor? 